This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. There's an old expression that you may or may not be familiar with. Me being old will be familiar with this old expression. And that is that you can't take it with you when you go. What does that mean, you can't take it with you when you go? The idea is you say to someone, look, spend your money because when you die, you can't take it with you. Now, a very good reason why you can't take it with you when you go, apart from any other beliefs you may have, is the fact that HMRC will want their share of the value of the estate left by the taxpayer when they die. And what we're going to see in an exam question is a situation where a taxpayer has died. This is the main situation, but not the only one, as we'll see in these notes. It is the main situation where a chargeability to IHT will arise when they die and when the value of their so-called chargeable estate is then transferred through to, well, when you die, where do you think you're going to leave your estate to? Now, in my case, I shall be leaving my estate to my wife. Why? Because she told me I had to leave it to her. And what that means is, something again, a little technical fact coming through to you here early on, is there won't be actually any IHT when I die. Because transfers between spouses, and wherever I say spouses again in this lecture, you will also then take that as meaning civil partners. Transfers between spouses are exempt. The idea with IHT is there is no IHT where one spouse dies and gives it to the other. But then at some point when the surviving spouse dies, I haven't broken this yet to my wife that, yes, after I've gone, she too will at some point sadly go too. But at that point, where will it go? It will go, go of course, there to our kids. Yes, those undeserving children of ours will then get the benefit of what would effectively be the total of both my estate that I left in its entirety to my wife, and then that plus her estate, which then goes to the kids. And IHT is basically there to catch that chargeable estate when it passes down a generation or two, however, whoever you give it to them. But it isn't chargeable when you make transfers between spouses. OK, what does all this hinge on? Well, what you're going to need here to begin with is obviously, which you've probably got open in readiness for this lecture, your study notes here at chapter 24 will be using this extensively and the example, uh, examples contained therein. But you also need some uh, spare note paper on which, surprisingly, to take notes, a few basic notes. Now, again, you can paraphrase these, you can abbreviate to your heart's consent. What you're going to find is everything that I've written here will also be within the notes. But I'm trying to pick out here what the key issues are that you need to know. So we'll start here with, under our heading of inheritance tax, or IHT as we will know it from now on, that for IHT to apply, as you see here, there must be, now here's the key statement, there must be a transfer of value. Now you may recall when we looked at the other capital tax, CGT, that for CGT to arise, and it would only arise in relation to lifetime transfers, that there had to be a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. Well, when we deal with IHT, there has to be a transfer of value. Now, that transfer of value is a gift. It's defined specifically as this we will see separately in the notes in a moment's time. A transfer of value is defined as the difference between the value of the estate before the transfer was made and the value of the estate after the transfer. So the transfer of value, the difference between what the taxpayer had before the transfer and what the taxpayer had after the transfer, which as you'll see in the notes in but a moment's time is usually equivalent to the open market value of whatever asset is being gifted. But there will be certain circumstances, the ones most likely, of course, to be examined, where it is not a matter of it being the market value of the asset disposed of, because that is different 
to the loss to the estate of the donor. You might very well say, if I'm giving away an asset that's worth £200,000, then surely before the transfer, I had 200000 After the transfer, I don't have it. The transfer of value, the loss to the estate of the donor is 200000 exactly the same as the market value of the asset being gifted. And in most cases, that is true. But in certain cases, most specifically, when we deal with shares in unquoted companies being transferred, we will see that there will indeed be a difference in the value of the asset that has been gifted, some of the shares that a taxpayer owns in such an unquoted company, and the difference in value between what they had before and what they had afterwards. And don't worry, I'm going to illustrate this with an example from your study notes in a moment's time. So the key issue is there has to be a transfer of value. Now, when do taxpayers usually make transfers of value? When do they give things away? Well, for most taxpayers, not because they're mean, they simply don't have the ability to give away in lifetime. They're not wealthy enough to give in lifetime. So the only occasion that the majority of taxpayers will make gifts, other than like Christmas presents and birthday presents, of course, that uh, again, for reasons as you will see later, will be exempted here, up to a certain amount anyway, that uh, when we have those uh, transfers that usually for most taxpayers who can't give in lifetime, the only time that a transfer of value is going to take place relevant to IHT is on their death. And that will be the value of their chargeable estate, their chargeable estate at death. So it's usually, a transfer of value usually arises on the death of a taxpayer when the chargeable estate at death will then be subject to IHT. That's the key point. As we'll discover later, once we've dealt with a simple example of taxpayer gave nothing away in lifetime and then had this within their chargeable estate at death, compute the IHT payable on that death estate. What we'll see, rather more relevant to your exam, where it gets more interesting, and there's a combination of assets, transfers that were made in lifetime, where this transfer of value principle is absolutely key in terms of your understanding, your ability to get this question right. And then there will also be the value of the chargeable estate that was gifted on death. But let's get to grips with this transfer of value and give you an illustration from those notes. So if I can ask you to go back to your study notes now, which hopefully are there in front of you, and we'll skip over that introduction at the moment, sufficient from what I've said so far. But here, we've got the point about a transfer of value in section two. First of all, the statement about this tax, which makes it so very different to other taxes that we have seen till now. IHT is a cumulative donor-based tax. Now, mostly when we've seen taxes, it's been as the result of an individual receiving value, receiving money, receiving an asset, whatever it might be. There will be a situation whereby they receive income. And when you receive income, then that is going to be chargeable to income tax. You sell an asset and you receive cash. That cash, those proceeds, giving that gain, that gain will then be subject to tax. So you're making money be it income or a capital gain. What's going to be the situation here is that you'll be making a gift. So you're going to be worse off after the gift than you were before the gift. Clearly, if the gift is on death, you're a lot worse off after the gift because you're dead. But what we have is a situation where IHT becomes payable in relation not to something that is received by the individual taxpayer concerned, but because they've given something away. That's the important issue here. And when it comes to dealing with a combination of not just the chargeable estate at death, where we start, but also some lifetime transfers that may become chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer as well, then it will seem to be a cumulative donor-based tax. Cumulative. 
So it's based on what the donor gives away and it is cumulative. What we'll see is you cannot look at in lifetime, let alone of death at the death estate. You cannot look at those lifetime transfers or the death estate in isolation. The amount of tax that may be payable on, say, a lifetime transfer, the same value that you have, say, a gift of £200,000, for example, then, as we will discover, the amount of tax that is payable in relation to such a gift could be as low as zero or as high as 40% of that £200,000 gift, £80,000. That is a very, very big difference. So we cannot just look at an individual gift that is made in lifetime and attempt, where appropriate, to compute the IHT thereon. This is a cumulative donor-based tax. And what happens now in terms of a transfer of value, in terms of its taxability, will also be a function of what has gone before it. But that is for later in these, this lecture. So it's a cumulative donor-based tax, and for it to arise, an individual must make a transfer of value, i.e. a gift, computed as, not though nine times a ten it, it equates to it, the open market value of the asset being gifted, but no, it is the loss to the estate of the donor. Calculated, we said a moment ago, as the difference in the estate value before and after the gift of the asset. The amount of tax that may be payable on a transfer of value is based on the cumulative amount of transfers made by the donor over a seven year period. Now, you don't have to worry about that at the moment, but when lifetime transfers come into an example, then those made usually within the seven years of the date of death, will impact not just on their chargeability, but on the amount of tax to pay on the chargeable estate as well. But this cumulative period that we look at, we call it a cumulative donor-based tax. The cumulative period that we'll be seeing working here will be a period of seven years. But again, we come back to that later. Now, for most assets, the transfer of value, as we said, will be the same as the open market value of the asset. For example, you give away a property worth £250,000. Before the transfer, I had the property worth two hundred and fifty. pounds After the transfer, I don't have it. I don't have that two hundred and fifty. pounds Before two hundred and fifty, pounds after zero, transfer of value £250,000. Same with cash, £100,000. £100,000 of cash I had before the transfer, I haven't got it after the transfer transfer of value is 100,000. So usually the market value of what is being gifted is indeed the same as the loss to the estate of the donor, and that will therefore be the transfer of value. But of course, often we see this principle being tested, so it's not just going to be computed as that market value. We must understand it to be, as we've now said several times, the loss to the estate of the donor. And as we mentioned a few minutes back now, that is most notably tested when dealing with shares in unquoted companies, where the transfer of value may be considerably higher than the market value of the asset being gifted. And that is because in unquoted companies, the valuation of a shareholding held by a taxpayer in that company is a function of the percentage shareholding, the number of shares that they have in that company. The bigger the shareholding, the greater that percentage shareholding the company, then the greater the control that that individual extends over that particular company. And therefore, the higher the price per share. So for example, if you had 1% of the shares in an unquoted company, and the other 99% were held mostly, well, let's say entirely by members of somebody else's family, then is your 1% going to be worth very much? No, it isn't, because what can you do with your 1%? It's 99% controlled by another uh, it's family, another set of individuals who have nothing to do with you. Your 1% is not going to be worth very much 
because there's nothing you can do with it. You have no control whatsoever. But imagine if I owned instead of 1%, 51%. Now then, that exercises control. And what we're saying here is that therefore a 51% interest is not valued at 51 times the value of a 1% interest. 51 times very little is still very little. The 51%, that's going to have a much higher price per share. So what you see, as we'll have in the example here, the illustration below, is a situation where the examiner tells you about shares being held in an unquoted company and that the share prices are as follows. And what you'll see is that the bigger the shareholding, the higher the share price. And it is in this situation that we properly test out. The examiner is seeking to properly test out. Do you understand this critical principle of the transfer of value, which underpins the calculations that we do for IHT? And that means that we take the difference between what the taxpayer had before the transfer and what the taxpayer had after the transfer. So let's have a look at what we've got here. We're asked to compute the transfer of value if, firstly, A were to die, leaving his shares to his daughter, or alternatively, and a lot more interestingly, as we will see, if he were to make a lifetime gift of 20,000 of his shares to his daughter. Right, what do we know then about A? A owns 60% of the shares in A Limited. A Limited has 100,000 £1 ordinary shares in issue. Share values have been agreed with HMRC as follows. Now, very obviously, he's got 60%. 60% 60 of 100,000 is 60,000 shares prior to making any transfer. Share valuations have been agreed with HMRC as follows. This information, whatever is needed and possibly more information, will be given to you by the examiner. You've got to use the correct information in the right way to compute then what the transfer of value would be. And we've got levels of shareholding here that range from 20% through to 80%, rising from £10 per share at 20% shareholding through to £40 per share at an 80% plus shareholding there. So what are we going to do? The easy bit, first of all, compute the transfer of value if A were to die, leaving what will therefore be all of his shares to his daughter. What will all of his shares be? He owns 60% of 100,000, so that's going to be 60,000 shares. It is a 60% interest. What did he have before the transfer? 60,000 shares valued at what did he have? A 60% shareholding. That, therefore, will be times £25 per share. After the transfer, what has he got? Well, he's dead, so A has got nothing. So the transfer of value is simply the value of the 60,000 shares. That, therefore, means if A died owning his 60,000 shares, that is a 60% shareholding, as we know, they would be valued at £25 per share, as we see there, for a 60% holding. And that means 60000 at £25 per share would be £1.5 million. And that simply reaffirms what your probable original thought was. Well, there you go, 60,000 shares. The share price, what they're worth, is £25 per share. And on that basis, therefore, it's £1.5 million. Yeah, there all of the shares were being gifted. And it's simple because what did you have before? All of your 60,000 shares, what were they worth? What did you have afterwards? No such shares worth, therefore, nothing. So it was the full value. It gets much more interesting where you have to deal with, as you will in an exam question, a lifetime transfer and compute the transfer on that of value where some, but not all, of the shares are being transferred. And that's what's being tested here, making a lifetime gift of 20,000 shares to his daughter. 
nothing. If you simply took the market value of what was being gifted, then 20,000 shares is a 20% interest. Therefore, those 20,000 shares would be valued at £10 per share, i.e. that would be £200,000. Now that, in point of fact, and I'll come back to this in a moment, is a relevant figure for taxation, but it's relevant in capital gains tax. Because what you should be aware of is if you make a lifetime gift of a chargeable asset, that is still a chargeable disposal, and again is based on open market value there. But for IHT purposes, we must also deal with this. Now, the transfer of value doesn't necessarily mean that that figure is then going to be charged to IHT at some future point in time. It won't be chargeable. The vast majority of lifetime transfers are not chargeable when they are made. They are known as, as we'll see later, potentially exempt transfers, which means that when they're made, no IHT is payable. They are potentially exempt. If they become exempt, then that's it, end of story. But if you were to die within, and this is where that seven year period comes in, if you were to die within seven years of having made that transfer, as we will see later, then that lifetime transfer, though it may not have been chargeable when it was made, will become chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. So it's a calculation that we may have to do. It may simply be set in isolation as an objective test in question, giving you the information as you had there, and simply saying that A gifted 20,000 of his 60,000 shares to his daughter on this particular date in A's lifetime, while A was still alive. Compute the transfer of value. So how do we do it? We look at, as we have said, what do you have before? What do you have after the transfer? Before the transfer, as we know, it was 60,000 shares. That was a 60% interest. Then it's valued at £25 per share, and that was 1.5 million. After the transfer of 20,000, a shareholding will have reduced to 40,000 shares, a 40% interest. 40% interest has a value of £15 a share. 40,000 at 15 there will be 600,000. So before the transfer, the shares, 60% shareholding, was worth 1.5 million. After the transfer, the 40% shareholding that remains is worth 600,000. The transfer of value is 900,000. That is very, very different to the open market value of the shares being transferred, which was, as we've already seen, 20,000 shares. That represented a 20% interest, and that meant that those shares would be valued at £10, i.e. 200,000. So the market value of what has been transferred here is 200,000. And that is what you would use for CGT. Back to that again in a second. But for IHT purposes, if the question states to compute the transfer of value for IHT purposes, you look at what did the taxpayer have before the transfer? What did he have after the transfer? Before 60,000 shares that were worth 1.5 million. After 40,000 shares, worth £600,000. Therefore, transfer of value, 900000 As we'll go on to learn, and as I've briefly mentioned, but we'll go on to look at the detail of this, this is a lifetime transfer, and such a gift to the daughter there will be called, will be labelled a potentially exempt transfer. Don't bother to write that down. I'll be talking you through the notes on it later. And that means that if the donor does survive for the required seven years following that transfer, then any transfer of value that arose will not prove to be chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. There will be an exempt transfer as a result. It was potentially exempt when made, 
If you live for seven years, it becomes absolutely exempt, therefore will not be taxable on your debt. But if the question simply asks you to compute the transfer of value, that's the way we do it. Before, afterwards, what is the difference? When we, or you, eventually get through to chapter 26, and I'll pull some of this out of chapter 26 later on in uh, this particular uh, chapter 24, once we've got a better understanding and knowledge of IHT, we may find in the 10 mark question in section C, the written section there for you, that we get that planning star question. And what it could be based on is something like this, that an individual makes a lifetime gift or gifts to various people. Usually, of course, it will be kids, grandchildren, maybe nieces or nephews there. Transfers between spouses, there will be neither CGT implications, nor will there be, as we now learned, IHT implications either. But there will be those transfers, like this one, giving 20,000 shares to the daughter. So what do we know for IHT purposes? We will know the name a little bit later in your notes. I've simply uh, referred to it. I've said it out loud to you. That would be a potentially exempt transfer. That will mean there'll be no immediate IHT liability, and there will only be a charge to inheritance tax if the taxpayer in question making that gift dies within the next seven years. Live for more than seven years, there will be no IHT, not when made, nor on death. Die within seven years, then it becomes chargeable. The transfer of value that you're going to base that chargeability on would be as we have there, £900,000. Immediately, however, you would, you would recognise, rather, that that lifetime gift was a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. And therefore, at the time and in the tax year in which that gift was made, you'd have to deal with the CGT implications. How do you compute a capital gain when there's no sale proceeds? You've given something away there. Well, the way that you deal with that is you pick up the market value of what is being gifted. So it means that in any CGT calculation, that would be your open market value to then use in a capital gains calculation. The open market value, gifted 20,000 shares, worth £10. That's a market value, a disposal consideration in your CGT calculation of £200,000. You would deduct from that the cost of those shares and then you would have the chargeable gain. But then life gets even more interesting. This is why this scenario could form the basis of a 10 mark, not just a 2 mark, question here. So we compute the transfer of value for IHT. We calculate the gain for CGT. Market value, 200,000, less the figure will be given as, as regards the cost that was incurred there. You'd be given the cost figure. Take away the cost, you've got the gain. What do we do with that? Well, if you take no other action, that gain would be chargeable based on that market value. You could then compute the CGT liability and, if necessary, state when that CGT liability would be paid. But you would also be asked to consider, are there any ways by which we could avoid the immediate CGT liability that would arise? And that, of course, is where you'd have to remember back to what you did in Chapter 14. Chapter 14, CGT Reliefs. And there was a relief, wasn't there, in relation to certain gifts being made by the taxpayer during their lifetime. Can you remember what that relief was in relation to a gift being made? Hmm. What was it called now? Oh yes, gift relief. And you then have to explain the way in which, well, in terms of objective testing question anyway, it would be that if it was a section B question. If it's section C, then 
you would be asked to deal with all of these issues and that would be in written form. So we'd have stated what it was for IHT purposes, a transfer of value, and how and when that would then form chargeability to IHT, only if the taxpayer died within seven years of having made that transfer. There'd be an immediate chargeability to CGT with a gain computed based on market value. You calculate the gain accordingly. You would then state that a gift relief claim would be available to be made there that would have the effect of deferring that gain. And if that gain is deferred, then you have to understand how that relief applies. Remember, if the donor is able to defer the gain, that reduces the base cost of that asset to the donee. But you would have to understand that the asset in question shares in unquoted companies here. It would be specifically a trading company. They are eligible in CGT terms to gift relief. You do not get gift relief just because you give an asset away. Get it because that particular gift specifically qualifies for gift relief. Now then, by the time you walk into the examination room, you have to have the ability, therefore, not in a big way, and only really, I suspect here, probably in a section C question, to be able, the 10 mark question section C, I should say, to be able to recognise that, yes, a gift made in lifetime involves both capital taxes, CGT immediately, calculate the gain based on market value. What can we then do with that gain? If donor and donee jointly elect, the gain can be deferred by using a claim for gift relief. What does that do? It defers the gain by reducing the base cost of that asset to the donee. A base cost that would have been equal to the market value but is now reduced by the gift relief, the amount of deferred gain. Moving the responsibility for the gain from the donor to eventually in the future, the donee, as and when the donee subsequently disposes of that asset. So we could deal with both the immediate CGT consequence and then explain the future consequence. Now, the details of that are contained, as I say, in chapter 26, which is where we bring all the individual taxes together. And before this, le no, not this lecture, before this chapter is out, I'll take you through the specific notes that deal with that particular issue. So a bit hard of me to throw that at you straight away. But bear in mind that you will see, and if you go on to advanced tax, you will see an awful lot of situations where an individual transaction may have an impact in more than one taxation. Again, here, it would be very basic so far as we're concerned in our Tax UK paper, but it would be that lifetime gift of that particular asset, those shares in an unquoted trading company, mean that there's an immediate CGT consequence. Here are the potential outcomes with and without gift relief. And there's also, for IHT purposes, what will come to know and love as a potentially exempt transfer, which means this is the transfer of value, this is how we compute it, but there's no immediate chargeability to IHT, and will, be, will only be such chargeability if the taxpayer then dies within seven years of that transfer. Okay, so the transfer of value is an incredibly important principle in terms of how you value that transfer for IHT purposes. And immediately we have already distinguished that between what you do for IHT and separately what you do for CGT. In the vast majority of situations of the assets being gifted that could be gifted in lifetime that may therefore impact on both CGT and IHT, they're going to simply have a market value, and that market value will also be the same as the transfer of value. But shares in unquoted companies, I would hazard a fairly good guess, 
that it is one that's going to be tested on a very regular basis there in examinations because it tests out that difference in valuation principles with what you do for CGT and what we do for IHT. OK, just going uh, back to how we got into this, therefore, we had to know how for IHT purposes to compute a transfer of value. We have seen that now. Our introduction here, going back to things I've already said, the majority of UK taxpayers will only experience chargeability to IHT on one occasion. And that, of course, is when they die. And that is if their chargeable estate exceeds something called the nil rate ban. When a taxpayer dies, the IHT computations that we produce will lead to taxability that will either be at, well, a very pleasant rate of tax, I'm sure you'll agree, the nil rate, and there is a nil rate ban that currently amounts to a very significant number, £325,000. But you go above that, which of course the taxpayer in your exam question or questions will have done, the excess will be taxed at 40%. Now that's a hell of a difference that we're talking in terms of, that up to the £325,000 worth of nil rate band, a nil rate applies. Notice here, this is a nil rate ban. It is a rate of taxation. This is not an exemption, though. It appears to be one and the same thing. This is a rate of taxation, the first £325,000 of your chargeable transfers to be taxed, benefit from a nil rate ban. But when you go above that, we go up to immediately being taxed at 40%. That is a very, very big number. So for most taxpayers, as we have just seen and said, the only occasion of charge is on the death of the taxpayer. And what at that point is chargeable to IHT? The contents of their chargeable estate at the date of death. That's like a little balance sheet, as it were, for the individual who has just died, where we add in all of the assets held, take out any liabilities that were due at the date of death, we even get to deduct, as we'll see shortly, so reasonable funeral expenses, no less. But we establish the value of the chargeable estate. If that exceeds our nil rate band of £325,000, then the excess over that £325,000 will be taxed at 40%. And so it is that the IHT will be computed. But it isn't going to be quite that straightforward so far as any exam question that you see is going to be. Because if it was only the estate at death that was chargeable to IHT, and sadly, you knew that you were not much longer for this world, and you had an estate of a million pounds, then you would know that that one million would hardly be touched by the 325,000 nil rate band, and the balance would be taxed at 40%. That is a huge IHT liability. So what you would do prior to the sad point at which you die is to give some of those assets away now while you are still alive. By giving them away now while alive, you reduce what will then be left within your chargeable estate at death. So if I've got a million pounds of estate, if I take away the 325, I've got 675. If I were to give away 675,000 pounds in the weeks or months, or as indeed we will see years prior to my death, then if it was only the death estate chargeable to tax, there would be little or no tax. I just give sufficient away to be able to leave myself with a chargeable estate at death of only about £325,000. So that would make it way too easy to avoid inheritance tax. The concept of IHT is a simple one. When assets pass from one generation to another, they will be chargeable to IHT. As we've already seen, transfers between spouses or civil partners, they are exempt. But when it goes to the kids, to the grandchildren, their nieces and nephews, when it passes down that generation, when it goes to other than your spouse or civil partner, 
there's going to be chargeability. So if I knew I was, as I said, not much longer for this world, hopefully I'm a lot much longer for this world, by the way, in which case I would be able to dispose of my assets, give them away in lifetime, reduce down the value of my estate to something like 325 when I die, and totally eliminate, but certainly hugely mitigate the exposure to tax. So, what happens here, therefore? HMRC have clearly thought about this one and thought, that's a gaping hole in the system. So what do we do? So here, as we just said, if only the assets still owned at the time of death were to be taxable, then, a little colloquial expression, death bed gifting, i.e. giving assets away just prior to death, would effectively avoid this tax. This means that certain lifetime gifts, those made within seven years of the date of death, that is going to be a very critical time period in relation to the IHT computations that you're called upon to deal with in your examination, that seven-year period before death. Again, it could have been seven days, it could have been seven weeks, seven months. They chose seven years. That is the figure that we use. That's the number we use. So anything that was made, any lifetime transfers that were made within the seven years before the date of death, that are not exempt transfers, of course, would now become chargeable on the death of the taxpayer. In addition to this, there are also some transfers made in lifetime, transfers into trusts. You don't have to worry about the significance of trusts or any detailed knowledge of them. Just think about a trust as being a separate taxable person. And if you see that a transfer is made in lifetime into a trust, which is likely to be the case in your exam question, then what that is going to mean for you, though we're not yet able to deal with it, is there'll have to be an IHT computation to deal with that lifetime transfer chargeable when made, as well as then dealing with lifetime transfers chargeable on death. But only those lifetime transfers made within the seven years of the date of death will be chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. Clearly, in real life, there's not a lot of people going around putting thousands of pounds into trusts there. We don't have the capacity to do that. But in an exam question, you're going to find it. So what we're going to have is the situation where in lifetime, there's probably three types of transfer that you're going to have to recognise. They are, as we've already mentioned, the exempt transfers. Exempt transfers. What are they? To spouses and civil partners. There are then uh, a little acronym you'll come to know and love, CLTs, Chargeable Lifetime Transfers. These are these transfers made into trusts, transfers into trusts, that will generate immediate chargeability to IHT, as well as chargeability on death. Now, I say as well as chargeability on death, as we've also seen in this note, that seven-year period is the critical issue. So on death, only those lifetime transfers made within the seven years before death become chargeable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. So in lifetime, three types of transfer for our IHT purposes. Exempt transfers, transfers into trusts which are chargeable lifetime transfers, meaning they're chargeable when made, as well as also becoming chargeable on death, but only if you die within seven years of having made them. Now, that leaves a whole lot of other transfers. Any other transfers other than exempt, transfers to spouses, basically there, or CLTs, transfers into trust, any other transfers, they got a lovely name. They are known as, another acronym we use here, PETs, P-E-Ts. That stands for Potentially Exempt Transfers. Potentially exempt transfers. The idea being, if I make a gift of £100,000 to my son, then at the time I make it, it is potentially exempt. It's not a transfer into a trust. It is to this person other than my spouse. 
it is a potentially exempt transfer. And what that means is, at the time I make that transfer, there is no immediate chargeability to IHT. And there will only be exposure to IHT if then selfishly I die within seven years of having made that transfer, thus creating chargeability. Because on death, it isn't just the chargeable estate that will be taxable, it will firstly be the lifetime transfers made within the seven years of the date of death. At that point, potentially exempt transfers made in that seven year period become chargeable for the one and only time because they were not chargeable when made. CLTs may become chargeable for an additional tax charge. Although there are two tax charges, one in lifetime when made and then additional tax on death, don't worry, the total liability could never be any more than if it had been a pet and there had been just one charge at the point of death. That maximum tax charge you could ever have is, of course, at your rate of 40%. OK, so we have got, therefore, for most taxpayers, all they have is their estate at death. They've not had the capacity to make lifetime gifts. And therefore, if they died with an estate, a chargeable estate at death, that little balance sheet, assets, lets, liabilities, chargeable estate at death, was 425000 what do we do? £325,000 of nil rate band would firstly apply, leaving 425 minus 325, 100,000. The 100,000 would then be taxed at 40%. A £40,000 IHT liability would arise. If what had already happened prior to death is that the taxpayer had gifted £125,000 in the seven years before death in the form of a pet, then that has predated the estate at death and therefore it gets the first use of the nil rate band. So 125000 transfer made, I don't say uh, six years ago, four years ago, two years ago, whenever, but within the seven years of the date of death. Taxpayer then dies within the seven years of having made that transfer. 125 is less than 325. So it uses the first £125,000 of the available nil rate band. That therefore leaves 200000 of the nil rate band. That then is applied against your chargeable estate at death. And the excess above that available nil rate band, there what's left over after dealing with lifetime transfers, that 200,000, first 200 of the estate at death at nil, balance at 40%. That's why we said that IHT is a cumulative donor-based tax, a cumulative donor-based tax. We cannot look at any individual transfer made in lifetime or on death and attempt to compute the IHT thereon. It's a cumulative donor-based tax. The amount of tax to be paid has got nothing to do with the recipient of those gifts. It's everything to do with the donor. And it's cumulative. If I made that first lifetime transfer of 125000 six years ago, it's covered by my nil rate band of 325 when I die. If I make another transfer of another, uh, what do I say, 125, another uh, 100,000 pounds, it's then still within the nil rate band. But if I then make a further transfer that takes me above the 325 total nil rate band, the excess will become chargeable. Now, don't worry, in our next session together, we'll be going through examples that will show lifetime transfers and then the estate at death, how we establish any tax paid on each lifetime transfer, working from seven years ago before date of death, then working through chronologically. The first chargeable transfer that occurs within the seven years before death 
it gets the benefit firstly of the neural rate band and you work chronologically and it's cumulative. As soon as you have used up the neural rate band, be it on the lifetime transfers or be it then on the lifetime transfers and on some of the death estate, the excess is going to all be taxed at 40%. It's a cumulative donor-based tax. Okay, now we made mention there, of course, of the uh, nil rate band, and we have referred to the available nil rate band. Again, that available nil rate band, we start with 325, and then we apply it on the death of the taxpayer, firstly to the lifetime transfers made within the seven years before death on a chronological basis. Then, if any is left over, it goes against the death estate. But as soon as we've used up that cumulative 325 nil rate band, then that's it. Anything else, either lifetime transfers and or the death estate, is taxable at 40%. What we will see in our next session together, as I've already said, is how we put those cumulative transfers together. The lifetime transfers, then dealing with the death estate, working at the IHT on each lifetime transfer and on the death estate. We'll also learn more about that nil rate band. What we've seen is it's £325,000. Well, there's more to learn on that because although it won't change for an individual, when an individual dies, if their spouse, strokes of a partner, had predeceased them and had not fully utilised their own nil rate band, then the proportion of their unused nil rate band will now apply. So when the second spouse dies, if, for example, the first spouse left everything to the surviving spouse, there would be no IHT. Transfers between spouses are exempt. There'd be no IHT. So that first spouse to die, leaving everything to their other half, as we know, that therefore would mean they have not used any of their nil rate band. At 100% unused nil rate band would transfer to the surviving spouse. So when that surviving spouse dies, if at their date of death the nil rate band is still £325,000, then they'll got get that plus another 100% of the unused nil rate band of the pre-deceased spouse. What we'll also discover, but it's only applicable for the death estate, is if your most valuable asset, probably your main residence, is included within the death estate and is bequeathed to a direct descendant, your child, your children, your grandchildren there, your great-grandchildren, whoever it might be, then there's another new rate man that is specific to that main residence, hence why it's called a residence nil rate band. Now, don't worry about these. We'll be dealing with them in our next session together there. But the basic concept is there. Most taxpayers only incur chargeability to IHT when they die. It is possible, as it will be, I suspect, in an exam question that you see, that they'll have a more interesting taxpayer to deal with who will, in lifetime, have made transfers into trusts, therefore creating a tax chargeability in lifetime, a lifetime transfer chargeable when made. But that's for a much later lecture. Next time, it'll be, let's see how the cumulative nature of this tax works, and let's get to grips with the application of the new rate band, and indeed, of the so-called residence nil rate band. We look forward to dealing with that with you next time.